progresses into speaking Spanish, but uh, they love the symbols. Um, and that thing is that I should kind of be happy with that. Um, what I wanted to start with the map of the continent is the, the most diverse place in the world. Uh, more languages, type of people, belief, religions, ideas, very dynamic, very funky. They invented more writing than any other places in the world. We know you credit to that. But this is a Google map that kind of show you for the first time for many, many centuries the actual dimension of the continent, how big is the place and how difficult is the place that in a way any attempt to try to describe what we've been forced in university African art or to teach African art in one semester is almost a possibility. That you, you know, university they teach um, Renaissance, that would be for uh, UCL have like four people teaching Renaissance in Europe and they have no one in African art. That is, uh, there is only one person that you can teach in African art as we're speaking right now. Uh, there have been only two in the last six years. <coughs> it's just a serious problem. We ask the people to teach African art in five seconds, but you can teach Western art in many, you know, as long as you want. And I think there's a serious problem in terms of uh, allocation of interest to Africa. But this is the area I just wanted to show what is known as Central Africa. And the area I do research is what uh, the Congo is called Bashi Congo. Um, it's the southern part of the uh, Democratic Republic of Congo on the northern side of uh, uh, Angola that go back as far as uh, 1276 is the first record we have of the formation of uh, state um, that will, will most of you recognize the early formation of a Congo state that goes back to the 13th century and been around for um, more than 700 years. But the, the challenge for me about African, African history and African heritage, modern history, heritage, how you know about the past, how you know about the people, who migrate into that place. Um, and migration in terms of uh, occupying the place, domesticating that place. Um, uh, we know the first migration, there's a kind of debate about exactly the, the pin down the time. It's around 100,000 to 200,000 years ago, um, the first, the humans migrate out of the continent and occupied the entire world as we know today. Um, the interesting thing is around 9,000, 8,000, 9,000 years ago, but it's right in the corner um, um, of Africa, what is Egypt right now, the Delta, the Niles uh, River, the African, the people arrived back to Africa. This was the second wave of occupations of, uh, of Africa, what we call modern humans. It's very, inter very important. Modern, modern human is not in, 19, in the 1500 run sign. The way biology recognizes modern human is this type of human that back to Africa 9,000 years ago with important tools of agency. They need to know how to do rock painting. Art was part of that um, important tool. Terracotta to make pottery and containers, iron, domestication of animals. But these four important technologies being used by those humans to conquer and occupy the entire continent. But never happened before in the history of humanity that have these four technology combined together. But the, the, the most important one is art. Art being one of the most important transformative factor in those humans from day one. And um, and when you think about, I showed you before, <coughs> that all the theories that have uh, been put forward believe a human migrate along the by watercourses, uh, rivers, or by the coastlines. Um, 
that is not true. But um, there's like three major hypotheses that have been forward in the last year that is somehow this idea of migrated into what is the Congo today around 1000 BC that humans, that not a human that arrived to, to Africa 9,000 years ago and um, in a way any, the, there is not a single record that proves that migration took place around the coastline as far as I know and, um, um, and we just want to show a few examples of rock painting in Angola and the Democratic Republic of Congo. This all the dots, this is the places I, I've been conducting research in 1999. So it's the first time uh, I went to, uh, the second time I went to Angola after my first time in 1986 and 1988. I stayed in Angola for two years. Um, and uh, 1999 was an important year because uh, UNITA used to be the five miles outside in Mbasa Congo. And I arrived as a crazy person in an uh, airplane that taking well, was taking uh, the governors and all the people from the from the government back into Rwanda. And I arrived to the place and everyone is just fleeing the, the but the advantage for me I, I used to have an American passport. I, it's, it's a long story. But I decided to say instead to escape and when Donita occupied and Mosa Congo. I was there in the Catholic missions, and I was able to do my research, my early research. In that. I couldn't tell that I was a veteran from the army fighting against Anita before 10 uh, years before, in 1986. Um, but anyway, what I want to give to you here is the example of research from the 60s from important um, uh, Portuguese and uh, Roland scholar from 1967 to 1974. Uh, that did the kind of foundation work in the try to understand the history of the Congo Kingdom, the history of Central Africa as an important place in the history of humanity, because more than 30 percent, between 30 and 35 percent of the population that been taken through the slave trade to the America came from that particular area. That made that made as a more important than any any African culture uh, ever um, in terms of the demographic, the impact of demographic in uh, shaping. Uh, particular culture and, and um, in the new places, even despite to be the subject of something like slavery. But the, the one I wanted you, you to pay attention is Kanigu from 7,840 years ago. The problem with that is that rock painting is before the modern human arrived there. Who did this? That is raised an important question about you have an incredible example of rock painting being made by, we don't know. What had to do with those people with the current um, cultural diversity we find in place in Angola and the Congo? We don't know, hasn't been studied. That by default, made I think about this important question like hybridity, creolization, and even co-opting those symbols into the new kind of need being put forward by these modern humans when they arrived to those places when they had to domesticate something out of the rainforest that we know is impossible to do only if you can cut down the entire forest and even that, the forest will find a way to but the, the first hypothesis about people in that particular area had to do with the uh, iron's evidence and we can kind of create a hypothesis about how old are the people from that particular area by um, providing the data about the irons and the metal smelting site that go back to uh, 3,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago, 3,000 years ago. But in a way, give a kind of framework of temporality that how, you know, for how long does site, that particular area being used by humans and but doesn't answer what had to do those human with the current people who live in that place. <coughs> well, we assume they are the same. And the second factor I would like you to consider, and I try to do through the book, is to understand the equatorial uh, forest system as a system that is, is defined in correlation to you have a 
rainforest, gallery forest, they, they co-opting together, they're working together as a system rather than in oppositions. Um, when I went and made this comment about the idea of traveling, migrating to Africa, we we'll always think about coastline as an as a obvious way to travel into Africa or to travel to the river. We know, as a matter of fact, you cannot go from Kinshasa to the delta of the Congo River because uh, the waterfall is impossible. That is what most of the tradition they felt. It's when you get all the way to uh, Matali, is is before Matali, impossible to cr to cross the river. But there is another way, uh, the way the Bakongo people about, think about the forest. The forest is like the great highway, and you use the elephant path as a way to understand how you move through the forest. And we never even entertain this possibility to understand that ecosystem by the animals and humans who've been in that ecosystem for many years. Instead to go through the rapids and waterfall that will risk and kill yourself, you should use a path already being made by hundreds of years by elephants because they know the forest better than anyone, anyone else. The other thing is the resources like water, specific in the Congo, um, um, but you will see that the incredible um, biodiversity of that place uh, allowed to that forest to be uh, the second biosystem in the world after the Amazon. Um, and the two most important there are in, in Angola. But, um, um. And the third one, the fourth number one is, uh, is the formation of a kingdom. The, the, when you think about kingdoms in that particular area, historical kingdom, the Congo, the Luango, the Songo, the Cuba, the, the famous one, the Luba, the Lunda, the Owibundu, and Vundu. And, uh, and there is a particular time about the formation of the kingdom, but there, we don't really know exactly which one comes first. The Congo-centric people, they believe the Congo are the first. The Bakongo people believe the uh, Congo Sansala is the, is the center of the land. We export it to the rest of the people. Um, and then most of the people, the, the, the people who study, like Young Thornton, believe in that, in that theory, but Congo are the first. Um, but I think it's why I recommend a little bit more research, the new generation of scholars to really challenge those preset assumptions. And uh, the last one is uh, to try to understand the slave trade. This is the, the show you the inland, the in route that being put forward by the slave trade and taking people as far and then Langa or Mambeto people all the way to the African diaspora to the slave trade. In a way, the only way you can understand Central Africa is by understanding all the different factors that shape the way we think about those places, including something like slavery for the last 500 years. But, uh, what I show you is all the places I, I research, I, I been in those places and try to understand um, what is the role of art when you are migrating to, from place A to place B, rather than the art itself. Uh, in, I, I did a conference on um, Friday, Friday, what's Friday now? About <coughs> Congo, the definition of art. I don't want to, this is just more about the book. That is more about what is the role of um, um, art in human migrations. During my research, I find out the space between all the sites is between 10 and 15 miles. That'll tell you more about how the people migrate to the rainforest. As you might know, you cannot go, you cannot walk into the rainforest in a straight line. It's impossible. The forest does not allow you to do that. You walk into the rainforest in the spiral. There's a, there's, a, there's a proverb in the Congo tradition that reflect this idea of these ethical uh, migrations. Because in, in Kikongo, a circle is a straight line, and vice versa. So when we think about the way we think uh, particular people in the world on the same geometric shape. We never even challenge that. We just being educated in a particular uh, school of knowledge 
and we think those knowledge that are compatible, they're universal. And it's just not the case for the Bakongo people. And they just show the kind of all the places I've been doing research, I did research for that preparation to that book. Um, 120 sites I visit, I document it. I know all of them that are in the book. I'm finishing a book right now on only rock paintings and I'm finishing another book on the religions. Um, that was the, the subject of the conference on, on, on Friday, last Friday. But here the proof, in a way, I haven't found any evidence of migrating to the coastline, as many people refers before me, that pretty much show those patterns all the way to uh, finishing in Mbasa Congo, that I found sites, space between 10 and 15 miles between them. And, um, and the question is, this idea of the first hypothesis about migrating to the coastline doesn't work. And I had to go back and, and think about how the local people talk about migration, how they remember human migration to that particular place and what is important to remember. I think it's that, that is more of a question for me. And on the left, you can see the hypothesis of um, coastline and the one the research that focused between Mbasa Congo and Kinshasa uh, that you know, show evidence of uh, rock paintings. In a, but the, the, the one I showed you before, the sites that have been documented uh, before, um, the oldest one, they are far from Mbasa Congo, in a way. Um, and it's one of the sites that, you know, this is a show that the map for me walking into the place sometime between um, two kilometers to 50, or two miles to 50 miles. And this is one of the sites, how it looked like the site um, when you're driving at the time, now it's a highway, yeah, and you can drive from the Mount Congo to uh, Lufu, is the, the, the town in the, in the border between Angola and Congo. You can do it in 45 minutes. Before, it used to take six hours. And this is a photograph of the actual site. You can see this rock rising up in the middle. This is just the beginning of the gallery forest. And the gallery forest is like a network. Uh, you can just be in that forest all the way to Kinshasa. You don't have to leave the forest. It's incredible incredible thing. It's just the beginning of that. Um, and this is an early site of uh, a place uh, called uh, Lufu. And uh, there's a uh, debate, it's a fight between two uh, scholars from Belgium. One believe uh, the site uh, is uh, being used around the 1500s, around the Renaissance. There's another evidence that shows the site being used around 7,000 years ago. Um, and there's no concrete evidence that really prove either of these two hypotheses. But what I want to show here is the incredible diversity of symbols and signs and symbols that have already been produced by uh, people in early, early time, the repertoire and how, um, um, how different they are. But the, the first one, I just wanted to just jump a little bit to the diaspora. My, my advisor, his name, his name is Robert Farris Stanton, still alive, he's 80, 86. This is a photograph he took in 1952 when he went to Cuba in a spring break when he studied at Yale. And um, he ended up in the middle of a park in Havana. And uh, this is what he described, and a lady, a, a, a black Cuban, told him, you need to walk. He couldn't, he was like, this white boy with a lot of privilege. He was this, his father told him, you have to be a lawyer or you have to be a priest. He's from El Paso, Texas. He speak 20, 25 lines. He's a monster. But he, he wasn't at the time. He was this very privileged boy from El Paso, Texas, in Cuba by accident. And this lady said, you need to walk. And he couldn't understand that. And the lady took him. And he ended up in an initiation house of a Palo Monte. This is the first photograph we have. There's now Lydia Carrera, Fernando Ortiz, have documentation of that. But what I wanted to show you here, the reason I wanted to show you in this image on the left, the, the cloth, they have this, the, like a dollar signs with seven star. The seven star is the name of Shango. It's a synthesizer of war of fire in the Yoruba religion. 
in Congo religion called Seven Rays. And is, that is a symbol, that is his name, that the club signify he will be initiated in Seven Rays equal Shango. But here you have a free line on the chip that represents the purity of the fauna and flora, the perfection of the power and energy that emerged from the flora and fauna. And the arrow is facing the northeast, that means he will be initiated. It's just a simple detail. Is someone before being initiated, all the preparation, all the symbol being deployed in the surface of this person to signify the welcoming of a new life. And in the right, it's just an example of the graphic writing system. I, well, uh, you have to memorize around um, 5,000 to 20,000 symbols throughout your life to be, to be fully uh, burst in that system. Um, but the ones that I wanted to show you here is uh, from, again, from Ruvu. I want to use Xerox in the symbol on the left called the Kenga, been studied by a famous uh, Congo philosopher, Fukiao Bunseki, who died two years ago, and uh, pretty much produced all his uh, scholarship in the, in the US. But he was uh, uh, very important for someone like John Janssen and Wyatt McGuffey, who was the main advisor for these two scholars when they did a full rights uh, fellowship for a year in um, Lubumbashi. And um, here, this idea of the Kenga is the, in, in the, the so field of our African art called graphic writing systems that try, try to um, deal with the idea of creating knowledge and meaning through graphic um, um, aids. This symbol is not, uh, we call symbol, it's not really a symbol, it's a cosmogram. It's a combination of multiple symbols that can articulate a complex uh, theory. And, um, and you can see the symbol can be used to describe the life itself, how the life came about, the meaning of life, and the meaning of God. But you can see the symbol that being in that particular region for as far as 7,840 years ago. Um, but this is a, the, just a kind of overview of the Kenga that had to do with uh, understanding the four cardinal points. Uh, and in the Congo will be the Congo circle in the Orleans is the uh, four cardinal. The Congo circle is uh, a circle, because circle means in the Congo completion. It's a circle, you are initiated, you're born in a circle, and you die in a circle. Very important in a, in a Congo as a geometric shape. In a, but the idea of knowing, as a metaphor, of living in society to knowing the moral complexity, the ethical challenges, uh, challenge of being humans, uh, and how to do with the uh, knowing is the four, the four cardinal points is knowing the human complexity, knowing how to experience with other people. But the Kenga is divided with two important elements. One would be the vertical line um, they call uh, uh, the horizontal line, I'm sorry, uh, Kalunga, that you use as the boundaries that divide the two realms, the realm of the living and the realm of the death. And, um, and also can be Kalunga in Kikongo can be translated as, a, as an ocean. It's not really the ocean, it's the frontier if you want us to. And a Mukula line is a vertical line that allows you to rise up from the other realm into the place of the living. In a way, and the color codification in the Bakongo people is different from any other places in the world. You only will find in, uh, in, in Central African culture. Yellow and ochre. <coughs> that represent the life itself, the creation of life. And what is black is that silence, that void after life is created. It doesn't have to do anything with death. It's very important. And red represents um, tukula, maturity. It's the most difficult moment in your life when you become an adult and you get married. It's the most dangerous moment in the life of a person. 
You are in red. We are in red now. And you died in white. White represents death. Black represents life in the Congo tradition. Completely opposite to the, the Western theory of color. And pretty much what you have here, the Bakongo believe every human is a small sun that migrate to the sky. And what take to us is to migrate from black to white. But only the expert, the one who knows, can rise up from yellow into red, like an Ndanga Mahuku, an expert in the religion. But here, you can go to this way to represent the world, the, that religious, spiritual world. It could be a circle, could be a diamond that is made out of a two triangle coming together in the middle. It's very important in the uh, Congo tradition. And what represents the two triangles coming together in the middle, two triangles coming together to make a diamond, the two lands, the two worlds, and uh, Mukula and Kalunga, what that represents and how it can be used in, uh, in the world of, of the living. Or when you can go back and explain the meaning of the color and the position and along the cardinal points. When they say, if you know the four corners of the world, you can live forever, that means you would know the complexity of being alive and die and make mistake. As you just example, this is from Fukiao from the 80s, 70s and 80s, and this is from Robert Farris Thompson in the uh, late 80s, kind of tries to collect the different variation of the meaning of uh, uh, the Kenya. But when you think about how you translate this moral philosophy, the Congo moral philosophy, into art, maybe many of you here are artists, that is a, the tricky question. You learn about this, we hear about this, how you translate. The Bakongo people already did that in the 19th century. And you can see the circle in Keta, the sources of life, of all power, of vitality. I don't like to use power, vitality. I think this is better for me. And this is just a head of a kizi that shows you the way, the place in which the medicine is placed to give an agency to this and kizi um, in the shape is, um, of a, a woman. is placed in a circle in the head, as a, as a headdress. And also, she has a necklace, also, to reinforce this idea of completion, the efficiency of that, that geometric shape that is reinforced by the perfect medicine that is placed in the, in the headdress. Again, when you think about the moment in which Congo tradition interacts with Catholicism, not because it has to be defined in the way we, we spend most of our work to try to define the logic of Congo art through the logic of Christianity. But that doesn't matter to me. Congo culture do not need to validate by any other religions whatsoever. They validate themselves. But here, this is a going back to the time in which the Portuguese arrived to what is now Rwanda, they couldn't occupy that bay because uh, what is now the Indian the Rwanda used to be the bank of the Congo, used to control Zimbu, used to be the currency at the time. Uh, the bank used to be in the island. And they couldn't occupy the most expert, the finest artist, an artisan in that area, used to come from the Congo Kingdom, used to be in the place of money. And the Portuguese used all the Bakongo artists to make the religious art from the 16th century, 17th century forward. But here, you will have a very interesting way to understand and re reorganize the iconography of a Portuguese religious object like the crucifix and give it this kind of Congo flavor that plays in the Dikenga that is synthesized with a Portuguese cross that has perfect arms that come from the Greek cross that is the king of four cardinal point could be the cross, the Portuguese cross, the Christian cross. It's a very clever way to manipulate their own knowledge and place through this new religious idiom. 
But here it represents also with a division, the use of the triangle coming together to make the four cardinal points, and just put in two and two, facing in the middle like Kulusu, and two come in the horizon to make the cross again. But now you go back to an Anchisian Kondi, a historical object. People would say traditional, I don't like the term tradition, historical object. That they're using the diamond shape also to decorate the place in which the medicine is whole in that Anchisian. We can talk about this object for hours because the Bakongo believe in more than 25 positions of your pupils. So you can communicate to your eyes, to people. Um, this is just one example. One can see far away and the other one can see you close at the same time. This is an key had that incredible ability. Um, the tears that represent the tears of death. Just uh, show, for example, all the sites like how they went from 2000 um, to 2010. That kind of refers in the book, um, and it's all the sites. Just given a flavor of uh, 120 sites that um, have been um, um, encountering through the year. I haven't. I cannot say I found it. I discover. I think I, I know. I discover. I just encounter them because the site been before me. People belong to families. That is an interesting difference from other rock painting sites in the world. Um, but the, the problem for me I was when I went to look for rock painting, I wanted to see an engraving or a painting inside a cave. That was kind of my assumption. And I, I, after my first night, I walked for 27 miles across this. Uh, um, small river, and, um, and this is the person who took me, that at the time he arrived six months before that photograph was taken <coughs> in 1999, and he was considered an outsider in an Angola they call Langa Langa, it's a Congolese person, and I have a negative connotation, I should not because Langa Langa is a beautiful, powerful word, beside the music connotation, and the Langa Langa is when you are looking from different uh, vantage points in Kikongo. Can, you can see you from here, but I can see you from over there. I can see you from here. That is what I mean, manga, in, a, in Kikongo. But it's somehow in Angola has a negative, negative connotation. Angalanga is a Congolese who won a path for an Angola. But he had this it, conflict with his family member because he only remembered the sites when he was seven, eight years old. Um, and it was kind of pushing to remember this side, he, he thought that you should have rock painting. But in his mind, it wasn't rock painting, he was thinking about engraving. I think he was right. But uh, we get to this place, and this is a cemetery that is from Kwanzaa village. It's now um, um, 50 miles from Ambassador Congo. And this is an early cemetery. But interesting in that, in that area, the people, <coughs> the site belonged to families and belong to the, the, the first settlement, when they migrate to this place, they decide to settle in a particular place in the forest. And after that, in 1935, the Portuguese forced the people to move to the road. They built all the way from the Congo to Kinshasa. But every village remember the first site. If I think is that he took me to the first site that the village recognized as the place that belonged to them, the first one. And this, uh, the first time we used it's 1975, and it's four uh, trees, and they have these engravings. But you can see the shell, the migration of a triangle, upside down triangle, crossing the boundaries. You're just coming down using the tree trunk as a conductor of these migrations, as a spiritual migration. The ancestor who died, who is ready to cross the border, turning to two, um, a triangle to meet is the middle point that is before completion. Um, but that, I wasn't satisfied with that. I get to this second site, and I met an um, 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 old man, Savan, who was 80, he was dying, and, um, and he talked to his nephew, who is the one on, on the left. I know I will die soon. And you can see the, the, the trees in the middle, this is like a savanna and the, in the back is a forest, there was the one on the right, and this is the entry 
into, you have to just go down around 50, 70 meters, it's just the entry into that, it's impossible to know there is a, a, a cave in that place in the middle. And um, there is a beautiful uh, flower called Congo Yasika that uh, grow, been growing like, like crazy for the last, in the last 20 years. And this is the actual cave. When uh, Savan died, uh, he became a symbol, a symbi, is a vital force. And he asked his nephew to take me to this place to meet him. Because this is not how he trusts me. And I get there. And I get into the water. And his, his nephew told me, you have to get into the water and walk inside. And I was walking on the water side, rising and get here. This is his nephew, this one here. Uh, welcome. This is my uh, my brother Barbara who's coming here, uncle. Um, um, he will he will do what you ask him to do. I think he's, I think he's ready a little bit nervous. But the uh, the thing here again, I didn't find the rock painting. What was important was the drawing on the ground that I now I consider as part of my study of rock painting and visual tradition. I couldn't until I'd been forced to be exposed to this kind of thing. My conceptions of what rock painting should look like kind of being changed by the way I've been exposed to this reality and the trust of uh, um, And this is a other site, also is in the book, Enfuakumi. Uh, and for Kong, it's a very difficult word to translate in any language. Also, in Kikong, it's a lot of debate. But it's a, it's a story of a couple, when they get married, they go to this river, and it's that pool on the right here. And when they are celebrating by themselves that important moment, they die. And M. is uh, is 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 a site of love and death simultaneously. It's a celebration of the two things. Um, and this is an example of a site on a multiple layer. What I'm doing right now is separating all the layers of uh, uh, depictions on the surface. Um, and just giving a, a sense of uh, um, how complex and uh, belong to the entire family. The family are in many different places. They are in Kinshasa, they are in Brussels, they are in Paris, and I, I follow each of them interview different generations to try to get into. Because rock painting in, in Angola and the Congo is the, there is an incredible oral history attached to the symbols and signs that you will find maybe in Australia and other places you will find it. And a, little bit, a few places in Native America. But I decided to create a concept that explains when you have a complex series of symbols I call iconic motifs. Um, when it's just one, I kind of see this only one symbol that is isolated from the rest. And when you look at the symbol, that symbol is attached to a proverb. And I put it, if you might know, a proverb in, in Central African tradition, uh, specific in Kikongo, the Kikongo you can translate, you can have a literary translation of the, the, the proverb from Kikongo into English, but that is not enough. There had to be an explanation of the proverb itself that unfold few, four sentences, sometimes a paragraph. And it's, that, that is a difficult part, how you articulate what? How you articulate the, the big meaning of a proverb that is synthesized in one sentence into this complex set of moral principles and lesson to the people in a, in a way when you think about you don't need to write a particular book because the actual book are the symbols deployed on the surface of the rock painting site, in a way. Um, and this is a place I have, I've, I've, I've been translating all 1,600 proverbs um, um, for the last 10 years into Kikongo, Kikongo Sansala. I cannot do Kimanyanga. Um, because I did the research in that particular area, this Kikongo Samsara is the main uh, type of Kikongo. I did it, the translation into Portuguese, French, and English, and it would be a second book in my next book is coming now. Um, but uh, and I tried to have a conversation between the actual symbols 
and the proverb. It's just one example of a double arrow. Or the when you have solomorphic representation, the one is uh, before is an icon um, abstract motif. Or, but here is a solomorphic representing um, a hand or a chicken. And uh, you can see the multiple triangle rising up and the at the end of a symbol is a hand just like on the top, like the crown of the symbol. And you can see the actual um, King Congo and how it translate into a very specific meaning in that society. And sometimes it has to do more with family and how you understand the family and love. Because uh, the idea of love in Kikongo is not about the way we think about love, it's about generosity. The term for love in Kikongo is generosity. Um, know that she's, you know, sometimes, I, I thought it's good, it's, it's, we have a cheesy understanding of love. But I think we need to understand that all the conceptualizations of that. But when you go into a more complex set of meaning, like what I call iconic narrative, when you have multiple symbols coming together, and this is just give you one symbol that describes the entire legal system, how law and government function in that system. But it's not deployed in the book, it's deployed in the rock painting. 40 miles in the forest, where you had to migrate to that place and learn about the principle of being a citizen in that society, to understand the rules, the prohibitions, the taboo, the tra how you translate that society. Everything is here. And, um, and Paul and Dumbo. The funny, funny enough, in, I've been. Uh, you, there is a the Baptist church, the British Baptist church, now now is part of the Regent Park College at Oxford. I've been researching in this library. It's amazing what they have. But I find out the George Greenhill, who was the founder of the Baptist church, he did report of a um, in Mansa Congo Protestant church, uh, talking about. How, how to create a new way of converting people into the religion throughout his life. Three generations of Grenhelm served in the Congo as a priest. His grandson, who I met a month ago, or a month and a half ago, said, I have my grandfather, my father, myself, wrote a book about one institution we thought was the key most important to understand the conversion of a Congo people into Christianity. So which one is that? And then but I cannot show I cannot share this information to the Baptist Church. Because at the same time the same people have been writing those documents about the people they wanted to convert. But they have this strange Personal research never been that just inherit by accident. They give it to me, and I'll try to find a way to incorporate this in my new book. But they identify for 150 years as the most important institution they need to understand, they need to penetrate, and destroy is a Dembo society. It's not Lemba. Everyone knows about Lemba. And I think, to be honest, it's been overrated. The last time Lemba was here with Holden Roberts and died, there was a ceremony of uh, Lembo, that would be the proper term. And I was there by accident. I was in the Mount Congo. And they performed Lembo. But and Lembo is about the government. It's about the principle that guide individual in that society. And every narrative has this building block, like the way you learn English or French or Dutch or Africana or Tulsa. It have an event that is, is somehow future to the writing or to the graphic aids, have uh, an action, and I have a description what should be followed. And there's a term in Kikongo, Lusansu or Sansa, that means to educate. You educate through graphic motif, not through 
the Roman alphabet system. You can do it when you live in a society that has multiple systems. But I want to show you here that the Hongo people already have their own system of teaching and learning. And the last one, this is the, I get lost for three days. And I get to this site. It's right at three, two and a half miles from the border. Um, and I show the, the someone who, uh, who was a priest who escaped from the civil war. And he remember when he stopped in the middle of the forest, a place <coughs> that had a lot of rock painting, and I kind of do like reverse engineering to find that site. We finally get to, after a third day, get into this place. And um, I just wanted to share the last thing just to conclude here, how the Bakongo people define time. And, um, and here you can see what they call hammerings, drawings, those holes made into a square. And there are combinations of a sequence of numbers, sometimes 35, 56, 74, because the Bakongo people, they don't divide at that time, the, the season being divided by season, dry season, rain season, not by month in the way we think about month. And you can see the sequence of a digit that makes a uh, sequence of six. But here, this is uh, going back to uh, researching the elders and how the, also the people in some house kind of calendar are used for agricultural purposes in the present day. Because they believe in the week have four days. It's, it's a, a sequence of four days is what made the week. Um, and it's just kind of the divisions of a, of a, of a year um, in seasons that pretty much made exactly the, the 364, 365 day we have in the normal calendar, in the Western calendar. Um, here, the division throughout the year and the actual name. Um, but here, this is not me. This is, as you can see, this is 1766. European travelers doing <coughs> research and they being deployed in the Mass of Congo, talking about the conceptualization of the Congo week as far as 1766. And still, a kind of dual calendar in the minds of many people the, they have these four days for agricultural practice and they have a Western calendar in the present day. You can see now the comparison between the two. And the last one, it just, uh, when you think about body language, um, we know how good the Congolese dancers are. You know, they're the best in the world. No? <laughs> <laughs> it's what they say, no? That can be argued. Yeah, well, the best are in Cuba. <laughs> um, but uh, what I try to say here, in that particular <coughs> site, there are 260 body positions that you will find through the body language being used in the present day in a Massa Congo. And you will find in the places like Cuba, Haiti, Brazil, United States, even play music like hip hop or b boy you can go back to the 19th century. The repertoire of both language being used in African American music on Afro um, um, diaspora music um, like tango, they are in those rock painting sites. Thank you very much.